Uh, let me say welcome to everybody. I'm so glad to have you. We have a, we have a nice sized crowd today. As a matter of fact, we're, your pictures go over two screens. Uh, so let's talk logistics a little bit. Um, uh, probably the way it's going to work best is if you either want to ask a question, put it in the chat. If you want to make a comment, don't put your comment in the chat. Just say, I've got a comment. And then one of us will will you know put you uh, put you on uh, but it's a little hard to know who's got their hand up when they're two two pages of screen so does that sound logistically like it it might work for everybody I'm gonna nod your head thanks um, so today we're going to be talking Lilan uh, it's going to be talking about how when they canceled her trip to New York City so she's talking about this cool trip and what happened instead uh, and one of the reasons I asked her to do it, first of all, she's a great presenter. I know she'll, she'll do a nice job. Uh, but the second reason is that it really raises a, an important kind of learning issue. One of the, one of the things we know, you know from learning theory, you know, like I only know five things and it's one of the five I know, so it's pretty important. Um, but one of the things you know, from learning theory that's really worth knowing is that learning happens through the making of connections. Uh, that the learner has to make a connection for some, and it can be to their personal lives, it can be what they know, it can be to their ambitions. What they connect to is not crucial, but the fact that they're making connections is. And so all of those things that we do to help students see how the things we do in the classroom are related to something else that they care about as well, um, those are really useful for for supporting learning. And oh, I'm so relieved that Leilan is nodding her head. So I'm not, <laughs> onto the, uh, I'm not doing a bad intro. So uh, after she's finished talking, one of the things we might want to do also is kind of open it up and ask people to <clears throat> think as we go forward about things you do um, to make can help students make connections and um, maybe how they need to be tweaked if you have to do that online. So Leilan, are you ready to get started? Sure. So Leilan, Alex. Um, okay, thanks you're for having me. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, I, I teach in fashion and I, so I teach fashion? a creativity course. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's right. Okay. So things over to you now. Uh, sure. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate okay. it. Um, Terry Lopez, who's our, our program director, said, could, could you write something up for Susan? I was like, well, what do you want written up for this? <laughs> so I contacted her and she said, no, let's just do a video. Um, so certainly appreciate it. But yeah, we had a, um, I teach in fashion um, and then I also teach the, the general creativity course, which by the way, quick commercial student, every student can, can join that if they want to. So if you're ever interested in it, let me know. Um, but what happened was we had a, a student tour to New York with 13 students, fashion-based, of course, and it's not, you know, it's domestic, so it wasn't as much of a problem as going through international. We also had a fashion tour to Italy that, that she had canceled that a couple of weeks earlier because, of course, Italy was one of the first um, hard-hit areas, and, and we were watching it very closely. Um, so when it came to it and we had to, to make the decision in uh, mid-March, we, you know, put the student safety first and we started looking for the refunds where we could and whatnot. But um, luckily we had a tour guide who is a local fellow in um, San Antonio and he's fashion based. So that's why we used him. But he said, well, you know, I feel really bad that the students are missing out on this. What, you know, can I, can I get them some of the speakers? Cause I can probably just contact them and see if they can come and talk to them online. Is there a way to do that? And we started working with it and, um, Turned out to be an excellent opportunity. The students really, really loved it. I kind of had to cut them off each time because it kept going over time. Um, and they had tons of questions. Um, so we, we ended up with four different speakers in, the, you know, in April. So basically we had one per week before classes shut down. And I recorded those through Zoom. And with Zoom, I always download it to my computer to a separate file because I know in if you keep it in Zoom, it will go away after 30 days or 60 days, I forget. But um, I do download those and then I re-upload them onto um, Blackboard as 
content files so that they're always going to be there and I can always reference them if needed. Now, I don't tend to um, share it beyond Blackboard because, of course, this is there's some designer information. There's stuff that they probably don't want out on social media for, since it was just for our class. So we are kind of careful about that sort of thing. But um, the students really enjoyed it. And afterwards, talking to that particular tour guide, he said, wow, this just works so much better than I thought. Uh, because what, it turned out that, that those, you know, 13 students really had the attention of that speaker for that, you know, hour and a half, essentially. So it really captured, it was two ways. It was capturing the, the teacher's attention, uh, I'm sorry, the speaker's attention, and was capturing the student's attention more so than when they were in an environment, they probably would have been more distracted. So it, it turned out really well, and I think some students felt more comfortable asking questions as opposed to when they're in front of this very kind of intimidating professional, um, they felt more comfortable about, you know, speaking up. Sometimes they typed it out in, in uh, the chat board. A lot of them didn't show their videos, which we, we know that's just part of the student generation. Some were, you know, they were in their car, they were kind of embarrassed about their background sort of thing. Um, and I, the, the speakers never quite understood that. They kept asking, why, why aren't they showing their pictures? But you know, I think, you know, the more we explain to the students that it's also a courtesy because people want to see your faces, and they want to see your reactions. Um, they started interacting more that way. They would turn on their cameras for that once I kind of talked to them about it. But it, it turned out to be, a, you know, sort of, you know, making lemonade from lemons situation that worked really well. And in fact, the, um, the tour guide that I was talking with, we've decided that we actually, if we can do this tour actually next year, it depends on travel restrictions, of course. But if we are allowed to, to do the tour in next spring, then we would actually want to incorporate this method ahead of time and get three to four speakers um, to talk to them through, uh, you know, a Zoom, uh, through an online chat of some sort like this and then be able to incorporate that as part of the coursework so that they, when they see that person again in you know, face to face, they're already more comfortable with them. And they already have questions built up and ready to go instead of trying to come up with it off the top of their head. They've had you know, a month or two to think about it and really develop you know, great questions on, on the content. So that was kind of it in a nutshell. Um, for assignments, of course, I counted attendance. If they couldn't come because some were working at the time and we had these were happening at odd times according to when that speaker could come on. Um, but again, it was recorded. So if a student missed the live meeting, they could go back, watch the recording, write up a quick summary for me and get their attendance points. So it worked out really well that they were still able to get something out of it and through that method. And then we also had, um, had for their final they had to to basically invent a fake journal of you know make up adventures of what they would have done if they had been there in new york for the week which was really fun to go through those at the end i had to send those to some of the speakers because they were they were so funny they actually included all of the speakers every student did it wasn't part of the the assignment but they did anyway so that's kind of it in a nutshell <laughs> So how did you get them to um, talk and ask questions? I know that when I have speakers to my class, you know, sort of live and in person, it's often a little bit of a, a, a struggle to get students to, to ask many questions. I don't know if anybody else has that experience. I think in general, probably. Um, this one was less, it naturally occurred, I think, because the students really connected with, this is a professional, this is somebody who's been in my shoes, you know, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, and so they started to make more of that connection to their learning, to their career that they wanted to. So it was, it was just so specific that they naturally saw that segue, I think. Oh, they, all, they naturally saw the connection. You didn't yeah. Know. And I, I guess I'm thinking at least as much about the sort of the shy, phenomenon as much as the, the connection phenomenon. Uh, sometimes that's, it takes a little Yeah, bit. sometimes some of them just won't speak up, but if you can encourage them to do the chat, um, that helps too. It's like the, you know, discussion board versus, you know, points for talking in class sort of thing. Some do much better with written than verbal. Yeah, some, so the students wrote a, uh, a summary if they, if they weren't able to make the live, the live, um, Thing. What, if they were there for the live one, was there any little written follow-up or anything or, or was that 
I didn't um, just because it was so last minute. If I had thought ahead and really planned it, I probably would have had some sort of reflection to go with that. But it, it does help. Okay. And I, because you can, mm. you can track how often the students um, access the videos. I was surprised how many that were at the, at the live meeting went back and watched it again. So that kind of surprised me. Do you think that might be why they mentioned them in their, their travel journals? They were like, you know, pulling stuff for the travel journal assignment? Well, a little bit, yeah, but I think they just really liked um, mm -hmm. those particular speakers. It really said something to them that they were, you know, real life people in the jobs that they wanted to be in. And so they were going back and listening to the, they, you know, these speakers gave a lot of good advice about, you know, life and how to get jobs and what to do in the job. Yeah. So it really helped that there was, it was more of a personal connection, I think, for this group than a general speaker would have. Yeah. yeah. So were these people designers or? What, what? It was um, because our students are design and merchandising. So it's kind of a mix of the, the art side versus the, the business side, to put it in more general terms. But so we had um, folks from all angles. So we had someone who's a, um, a buyer for a major um, oh. actually for a Canadian company and then a designer for that same Canadian kind of company so they could see the connection. Um, we had a design team that worked for a very small mom and pop kind of um, mm -hmm. firm and then we had um, um, a gentleman who basically ships millions of suits a day so <laughs> to, you know to, to, to put the, the jobs in is easy to understand you know less jargon terms but yeah. So it was all over the place. It was some design, some business. Okay, that's that's interesting. Yeah. So we have any questions? I have, yeah. I have a question. Yeah, I, Gil. This is a how-to thing. Um, you said you uploaded the videos to what sites? Because I upload videos to Blackboard. Is there a more friendly, easy to get inside? There actually, I, I do upload them to Blackboard occasionally in another class where I do demo videos, I'll actually do a private YouTube link because the students have an easier time with that. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, right. But there's an easier way to upload, especially if you have quite a few to upload. Um, let me see here if I can screen share real quick. Well, the, the, the YouTube channel is an easy way of doing it, I think. It but is, and then you just keep the private, um, keep the, the private, um, link so it's not where anybody could find it so when you're in blackboard if you look under the content collection um, i find it easier just to upload things to this i can upload several videos and walk away and come back and then when i go to actually put it into the course documents wherever i, I put it um, i can build the content of a video and then tell it to browse the course rather than to browse my computer. And it seems to take less time. I don't know why, but it, it does seem to make it easier. Plus I can, um, anything that I've uploaded for previous classes, like I said, I use that for, uh, for um, demo videos that I do for flat patterns, for sewing, things like that. I, I really have to upload it one time and then I just have to go in and search for the right course because you can pick a different course from the past, you can pick one from last year or the year before, and it it loads up like that because it's already up on the server. So it's a fast way to do it. Now that doesn't help if it's a big file. It doesn't help with the students trying to download and to view the file. YouTube is the better answer for that. Just have a private link for that. And so you just post the link in your Blackboard site. Yeah, I'll actually um, let me go to that course. I don't even technically say what the link is. I, I'm sure there's a way to backdoor it for them. Um, if they're clever, depends on how clever they are. <laughs> but I'll usually just share that again. Um, where, it, okay, course documents, videos. So when I put it in here, um, well, one, they ask for pictures. So I've got, you know, these giant pictures that they can look at. There's the video itself. And then there's a YouTube link, which, you know, it doesn't necessarily tell you what the link is. It's just you click on it and it goes there. Um, but of course, all it takes, all they have to do is copy it from here. So 
I just ask them not to share it because they're paying for this content. I remind them that, you know, this is part of your college course. You're paying a lot of money for this. So you don't want to just hand this out to um, friends and family for free. So that way it's, it's ready and it's a lot easier for them to view from their phones or their tablets, which most of them are working on phone, phones and tablets rather than actual laptops. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, so let's uh, one, two, three, the steps again. So you, uh, with the Zoom one, so you've got uh, the speaker that you're recording on Zoom and then you uh, save to your computer. And then from there, it's just as if it were anything else you put it, you know, either put it into YouTube, put it on Blackboard, and so mm -hmm. on, right? Okay. Yep, I, I, I will always, um, I just have this, you know, backup thing. Um, it's kind of OCD version of backing up everything, because <laughs> I just back up like crazy. Um, and in YouTube, like, I mean, sorry, um, Zoom, like I said, I think it disappears after 30 days or 60 days. It I don't does. remember what it is. Uh, yeah. But you can actually just download the files and, you know, if you had chat, you can download the chat with it. And if you just want the audio, you can download all in the audio. Um, so I just saved them onto my OneDrive file. Um, mm -hmm. And so it's always there if I need to go back to it for some reason. Now, if I need to go through cleaning up, I may, you know, do four or five years back and I don't need those anymore. So I'll just clean those up. So it saves room on the hard drive when it tries to download what it does from OneDrive onto the hard drive. Yeah. Okay, other questions? I just wanted to circle back to the conversation about yes. the presentation that the, yes. that that the presenter. Um, I just had a couple of questions. Did you do everything, and, I, and if I missed this, I apologize because I joined a few minutes late, but for the, um, was it synchronous or asynchronous, the work that you did where the students were participating? Was there anything where they, um, they had like discussion groups or things like that around the videos or were the assignments all kind of individually reflecting and things like that? Um, boy, I wish I had thought that far ahead. We, we were tr literally like trying to run and pick things up and calling people and saying, hey, can you do this? Uh, <laughs> so I think it would have been better if I'd had some discussion board going with it. And I think the students certainly would have gotten more out of it and would have been happy to to do it because they were so excited about these particular sp speakers for the most part it was synchronous um of course like i said i recorded it so that students who could not be there at that time could go back and and uh, watch it and reflect and we we did at, go back at the end um as a a group without a speaker there and just talked about the different speakers who was your favorite what did you like? What did you get out of it? That sort of thing. And asked if there were further questions. And there were a couple that we could, you know, then email to those speakers so they could still connect to them. But um, I think, yeah, in retrospect, certainly that would have been a, um, a fabulous addition is, you know, some sort of additional reflection or like you said, discussion board would have been great so that they could have talked amongst themselves and really gotten more out of it. There's another question in the chat. Um, how did you uh, establish the format for your speakers to in ensure the time frame and questions and the speakers on capacity to use Zoom? Uh, for the capacity to use Zoom, I sent them the link early and if they wanted to practice, they could. So, and it was, you know, Zoom's pretty self-explanatory for most people. I think that um, they were able to pick it up fairly, fairly easily. We kept it to the normal class frame of about an hour and 15 minutes, but a lot of times it went over. Um, and I, I told the students if they needed to go, they could because I realized, you know, they've got other classes that they may have had to, to jump in on and whatnot. Um, but for the most part, they would stay and they just keep asking questions. And so um, a couple of them went to almost two hours. So it just... Oh, right. Yeah, <laughs> between the, the speaker and then the students, I was, I, you know, I just kind of sat there and nodded and it took off on its own. It didn't need a whole lot of um, extra, you know, pushing on my end or saying, hey, who has questions? Anyone have questions? That sort of thing. So it, it did a good job. I think, again, it really had to do with the specific speakers matching with the, the students of that one, that they could see a direct connection to their their own careers. Yeah. Monica, and here's a, a, um, Monica yeah, as well. Yeah, so I had them make a fake, they were supposed to, if we'd gone on the trip, they were supposed to keep up with the journal. 
take pictures, add it all in, they could turn it into a blog or they can do a video version of vlog, whatever they wanted. Um, and so we just turned it into a faux journal um, so that they basically had to come up with, you know, fun little adventure. I told them they could make up whatever they want. It could get as crazy as they wanted to, but they had to have, you know, entries for each day and pictures. And so most of them stole pictures from the internet as students do, <laughs> but they didn't, you know, have any primary content on, on their own. And they just, some of them went to town and made up all sorts of idiotic, but fun adventures that they had with their roommates and this happened and that and the teachers did this and you know some of it was really silly but it was still they clearly had fun with it and they all brought in they you know they basically added one of the the four speakers into a particular day they just picked a day and put him in there and said we went and toured their studio this and that and so it, it was fun in the end I don't think I saw any that were you know just hitting the minimum of what they needed to do they really all went above and beyond on that so let's okay, thank you. That's for, that's for interesting because I wonder how we could use that probably in nursing because one of the concerns is if they can't make it into clinical, but one of the things, like I teach immersion, which is the last clinical course, which they basically go work like a nurse for 120 hours, mm. and there's concern that they won't be able to get in clinical with nurses in the fall. Yeah. So that's interesting because maybe they could, because they do reflective journaling. They do that as part of immersion and the different courses and assignments, but it's kind of interesting that we could probably do a faux journal because it's not just about the adventure of what they did, but that they're including some kind of pathophys or a disease process from a patient they took care of and they would have to be looking up how mm -hmm. they would take care of that patient and then mention that or any kind of issues they might have in care. So that's kind of interesting, that faux journal. I hadn't thought about that. But yeah, they have to do some work for do, us to, yeah. This generation will do the research and to find more. If they get interested in, in one thing, they'll really dig into it. So, right, right. That's interesting. Yeah, thank you for that idea. Yeah. Yeah. I have a quick question, follow up to that. Did, did you have them use the, the software like the blog and the wiki and all that that's in the learning management system, or did you just say, whatever platform you want to use. It was open-ended, yeah, whatever that was available to them. I didn't want to restrict them too much because some have really limited um, internet service, others, you know, they just have limited computing service opportunities. So it's sort of, if they wanted to cut and paste something together and take pictures with their phone, they could have done that. Most of them did something through PowerPoint with some voiceover or, um, they wrote it up in Word and inserted pictures for the most part. It was pretty, you know, they, they kind of kept the simple technology on that. So I didn't push the other um, options. So in an ordinary year, what, what choices do they make for that journal? Um, well, the last time I did this was four or five years ago. So the, the technology wasn't as prevalent at that point. So yeah, it was kind of the same thing even, well, they didn't even really do much in terms of, they did a lot more voiceover PowerPoints this time than I've ever seen before. But I think they're really comfortable with that now, whereas before it was sort of new, um, a feature that they just didn't access much. It, it was still, you know, certainly around at that point, but it was just something that they didn't access as much. But I think, uh, you know, as, as it becomes easier, there's tons of options out there. There's like the, the Powtoons and, um, a number of other fun little ways to put those pre presentations together. And I think that they're finding them on their own, which is interesting um, and doing a lot of exploration because they're always looking for a new way to be creative and to kind of show each other up a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Other questions? Um, here's a comment from Monica. Monica, could your nurse preceptor video chat with small groups of students as if they were following on rounds. Uh, that came from Renee and I think she was throwing it at me about a possibility. Yeah, we've talked about that. The hardest part is, um, like I said, we don't even know if we're gonna be able to get preceptors. We don't even know if they're gonna be open to accept because we thought about one of the thing is, maybe you don't get as many preceptors, so we have them half time and then do the other half in simulation. You know, so there's been that. Then we switch over to the leadership management part. That would probably be a little bit easier or more, because we can, we can uh, lock in and get, uh, we usually have preceptors that are like nurse managers and directors and things like that. Mm -hmm. And so we could probably have 
one that would speak to them, as you said, like kind of have a speaker that would talk to them, which is kind of what we did. We would bring in speakers sometimes to talk to them live. Um, and one thing that we did this time that I, I'm not sure if y'all are aware of is um, Julie Nato. She works, she teaches a class with me. Is we had several alumni because we talk about them being professionals and developing their professional development as professional nurses. And so we have alumni from different years. We had an alumni panel. It was really nice when we did it live in person. And they're just, you know, talking about how they fell into leadership and what they did and those experiences. So we thought, why not? Let's try it this way. And so we did it through Zoom and we did it and it worked out well too. We had so, and it kind of is easier for some of those clinical people because they were in the hospital busy, would take a little bit of time. So there is a lot of opportunity there. It's just about like the journal. I hadn't thought about that, that it's not real, but at the same time, even though it's not real, they'd have to look up some things and develop some things just to be able to be credible in what they were saying. So it wouldn't just be completely faux, like just, you know, fascination. So I just found that thought of it, the faux, the faux journal being interesting. Yeah, we'll have to, I think we will have to be creative on what we're going to do and how to get them engaged with those nurses. Yeah, I mean, it's going to be difficult, I think, for lots of disciplines that have field-based components. I know um, teacher ed, all the, um, all of the, uh, Student teachers were pulled out um, in in March, mm -hmm. and I don't. We don't know if back, um, mm -hmm. and and so it goes. Then you also have the privacy issues. You have to be real careful with HIPAA and videoing in the hospitals and things like that, and who's around. You can't control that all the time. So I'd imagine that would be the same with the schools, that you just can't be having a camera on because you've got these children and students in there. So that's the same thing with us. We've got patients in the hospital, and they just can't turn on a camera, and you know, so that's no. another uh, yeah, consideration. Yeah long conversations about what they can and can't do with their phone. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Other questions, comments? Well, let me return then to our kind of our, our opening issue, which was the issue of helping students make connections between what's going on in the classroom and in the rest of their lives or um, their other classes. What are some things people do aside from trips and speakers? Yeah, Vani. Vani, you want to unmute? Yeah, I'm unmuting. <clears throat> I, I have been doing this for several, uh, three or four semesters and having my students do nature reflections since I teach biology to get them to go outside because they don't spend any time outside. And it's just a simple activity where they do it four times during the semester they have to go to the same place. It's supposed to be away from, it's supposed to be away from people and away from roads and parking lots. Some of them make it to the picnic table between the two buildings. Most of them get a little farther <laughs> away than the, head. the headwaters is a, <laughs> is a pretty popular place. So we started in, their first one was due right before spring break because the weather had been, you know, you never can count on the weather in January and February. So we only did one reflection in one of the, the only, direction they have is it can't be more than one page. They have to take a picture at the first and the last and then, you know, talk a little bit about the change. That's the only one I give them any direction. They can write about whatever they want to. Mm -hmm. don't be about nature, it can just be anything that comes to their minds. And they write about all over the map. So then when we didn't come back, I just said, okay, I'm gonna give you full credit for this assignment if you just did one of them because you can't go back to the places where you were and all of them had scattered. But then they started emailing me and said, well, can we do it? Can we still keep doing it and just do it, do it in a different place? Can we do it for extra credit? <laughs> so I said, hey, you can do it. And, and I'll give you extra credit on your last test. But it was, a, I got some amazing reflections from them. And they talked a lot about their experience with, the whole, this whole transition into online. They talked a lot about how they thought about uh, how our relationship to the environment had, was, uh, was in such a poor state that they felt like that it had something to do with all of these things that were happening to us. I mean, what they wrote about was really astonishing when they wrote the reflections that they just on their own voluntarily did so i it was really interesting to see how they uh use that and, and one of them one of my students who he's kind of he, i could tell he didn't like the assignment when i first made it and one of the things that he wrote is he said 
I really hated the thought of doing this assignment, something along those lines. And he said, I thought this was really stupid. And he said, and now I'm really glad you made me do it. So, <laughs> uh, they, and, and they all really appreciated being, uh, you know, sort of having to venture out, even though they only may have ventured out to their patio for obvious reasons because of the fear of going anyplace else that, uh, it, it, I got some interesting information from what was going on with them and what they thought about. And so that was one way that even That's though, very interesting. Yeah. Even though it, that was an assignment that was offline and could be done online. So maybe <laughs> think about what you're doing anyway that they could do on their own. Yeah. Yeah. Lorena, you want to say a little bit about how you use discussion boards to help students make connections? Yes, ma'am. Previously in other um, courses, we didn't really maximize discussion boards, but towards the end of the course, um, we, we did. And in order to achieve the objectives, we had discussion, six, six objectives, six different um, discussions but they would pick three and then respond to three and it was it was we could really see that they were they the ones they didn't pick or maybe they didn't feel as comfortable with but once they saw somebody else who made a connection or could connect to that then they learned from each other as well so that really um, opened my eyes and to the value of using discussion boards with BSM undergraduates. Usually I've seen that in master's programs and doctorate programs used a lot, but not so much in BSN. And, and this really, really did show that they were getting the concepts and achieving the learning objectives. Could you clarify for me just a tiny bit how you gave them the choice? You what set up six threads and they picked three? Right. So that's the, that was the instruction. I said, okay, so I have six threads and they were related to different learning objectives. Pick three and write uh, no more than 120 words, uh, your experience, um, your understanding. And there was some, um, some like uh, prompt question prompts. Mm -hmm. And I said, okay, now you wrote about those, but now you have to respond to three people uh, in the other forums. So then I could evaluate their current understanding of the issue. And then, and then I could also evaluate, um, evaluate their re response to other people. I don't know if that makes sense, but yeah, that's kind of how it went. I can show an example. Yeah. Well, you know, I just know somebody who's been on the student end of being an, on a discussion board. The idea of choice is very, very appealing because sometimes I look at that thread and I say, oh, please, please, not, not, not this one. Uh, so, you know, it's wonderful, I think, to have some choices. We typically have choice in conversation. Somebody if I could tag, tag on to that, uh, since yeah, I was Michael. a clinical instructor, and not to steal any Dr. Paul's uh, thunder, but to add on, uh, it was interesting to see too the, the students' uh, responses in terms of uh, use of references, because they were asked to uh, reference uh, mm -hmm. most of the time uh, their answers, uh, and to see who were more the piggybackers versus those who were the originators, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, if I could also add another element that Dr. Paul came up with uh, in conjunction with our clinical that we had originally set up for Communicare face-to-face -face working with patients to make connection, uh, Dr. Paul then opted to have the students make telephone interviews in cooperation with Communicare and their administration make telephone interviews to the clients uh, regarding their overall health status, uh, their knowledge of COVID-19 and what they were doing for precautions. And, you know, we used a low tech, relatively speaking, telephone and gained a great amount of information. And in fact, you know, had the sort of aha experience that because we had to resort to this, we now want to use it, just as Lalan was talking about using that for uh, their the Zoom interview for like a pre pre tour aspect. But this could be 
uh, a really w a good way to supplement or uh, complement the clinical experience uh, for for many levels. And additionally, additionally, one other thing that uh, Dr. Paul and I I had worked with her and Sister Martha Ann Kirk, we had a tour uh, set up originally, just like you know New York City, but this was San Antonio inner city. And uh, we were going to have the students, based on previous experiences that we'd done, have them look and uh, reflect upon murals and their, their relationship to health and health care, because so many of them uh, do deal with those topics. And uh, uh, it turned out that uh, Sister Martha Ann was uh, willing to do a Zoom presentation with the mural pictures. And it was quite, uh, I think, refreshing for the students. And it also came at the very end. So it was another way of making uh, connections, both between st students and faculty, as well as students and, and the community. Yeah, you know, I've done the mural tour and as you're talking about doing it virtually, it seems to me it would just work beautifully, you know? Um, and I think all of the murals are online, so it wouldn't be that difficult to, uh, to make that happen. Uh, yeah, our next, our next challenge is to uh, go for environmental health and, and really do uh, the Headwaters tour virtually if necessary with Pamela okay. Ball. All right. Somebody put in the chat something about uh, having students do a SWOT analysis on themselves. Would, would you uh, speak to that a little bit? Describe what a SWOT analysis is for those from other disciplines and? It, it was me, it was Monica. Um, uh -huh, Monica, it's okay. Gonna, it, it's me again, sorry. It's the first day and I think we spent a, in that last level, it's highly stressful for them because they're taking exit and trying to enter practice and everything, so there's a lot going on. and. The, we take a lot of time during that first day just trying to establish the relationship in the sense of while well, we're taking attendance, we ask them, tell us something interesting about you. And that kind of lets me know what they want me to think about them. That gets me, it gives me some information. So when I start talking about things, I kind of know what to throw in to lectures or group talks. And then uh, another thing we do is we have them do a SWOT analysis, which is basically, uh, it's like a four quadrant little sheet that I give them. Um, and then the back side of it gives you like some kind of questions that you're kind of answering because they might not know. And they're broken up into strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats on themselves. And so they, it tells you a lot of what the student, sometimes the student will tell you, you know, one of my threats is I'm a, I'm a mom and I have three kids and being able to study. So it gives me some idea of who this person is um, and what they think about themselves. Uh, it was real interesting this time too, because on one of our final exams or last exams, we asked them to verbalize what differences they saw from the first SWOT analysis they did towards the end of, you know, when they're leave, leaving, leaving school. And the other thing um, that I was gonna say is, I also asked them, what is it, like this is the leadership, it's called the nursing capstone, leadership capstone course, it used to be leadership and management, is we ask them what they think they're going to learn in this course and what they'd like to learn about in this course. This also helps clarify, okay, they're, they're not sure of what they're going to learn in the course, but it also gives me an idea of what kinds of topics we can bring in because we teach some general things like conflict, communication, you know, leadership that we can, what they're interested in, we can kind of tailor it in there or bring it in there. You can fit it in there once you kind of know what their perspective is or what the direction they kind of want to go in and then get our course objectives done at the same time. So just kind of, it takes time on that first day, but it does help us try and get to know them a little bit better you know, as we're kind of go down this road. And this might really help a lot if we wind up staying online and the fog gives you a better idea of what's, you know, what threats they have, you know, those kinds of things. And, you know, even if you're face to face. Um, yeah, we, we'll keep doing it. We've been doing, I've been, the SWOT analysis just came out. We've been doing it for years now. So. Yeah. Gil, what were you going to say? You need to unmute. Sorry about that. Uh, yes, okay. on, the, on our percent, when you selected the speakers, uh, what kind of assurance did you have that they would hold the students' attention for an hour? Oh, for the, the New York speakers? Right. 
Um, I really didn't. I actually relied on the, the tour guide because he knew them personally. And he spent so much time. I mean, it was just a blessing having this one, one person on board because he knew these people and he set them up in a way because he said, I want to start with this one because she's really dynamic and she gets everybody really excited. Then I want to follow with this one. And, and so he had this whole plan in his head of which speaker would be best for what. So it was, it was personal background, I would say from, from the- When you were describing that, I was thinking, I'm a history prof and I was thinking, well, I know enough people in the city of San Antonio and the museums and other, and other uh, institutes uh, that I could invite uh, whom I think are interesting, but you know, the question is to whether they would hold the student's attention for an hour. I don't know if, if I'd want to have that interview first and, and tape it and then show it to the students, um, you know, kind of like a hard call. Yeah, a lot of times it just takes somebody with real energy. Yeah, and it wouldn't have to be for an hour. I mean, that's a long time to, to right. have experience. Right. You might do think about doing something for a half hour or 20 minutes. Particularly if you've know, got some highly focused issue you'd like the person to talk about. Right. Yeah, well, most of the speakers, I'd say, they, they talked for some only 10 minutes, some only about you know, 20 or 30, and then it was all question and answer after that, and that's okay. why it lasted so long. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Leilani, you put in the chat something about uh, your, one of your first day activities? You, uh, it was uh, yeah, and we, we talked about this at one of the other sessions I did for you. I don't remember if you were there or, there, uh, or not, but we call it give and take. And it's one of the, the activities I picked up from a creativity class. It's very similar to what Monica was describing, just a little different take on it. But, um, you use a lot of post-it notes for this, but basically they, they you know, it, everybody gets a, a big post-it note and they write down something that they want to give to the class, something that they can give. And it could be friendship. It could be, I have a, you know, a lot of fashion knowledge, whatever it is. So it could, you know, give them a few examples that they can work with. Um, and then everybody reads it and puts it up on, um, I usually use the, the giant chart, um, yeah. Yeah, the sticky sticky back so I can save them. So they'll put everything up in the give section and then they say, now what do you want to take from the class? So what do you want to get out of this? So we, we you know, and it could be again, a lot of really good knowledge. It could be making new friends. It could be, you know, finding an emotional support group, whatever it is. <laughs> but so, and then we come back at the end of the semester and say, you know, did you, you know, Monica, you said you wanted to to give a lot of laughs to the group, and did you do that? Yes or no? And you know, you said you wanted to get you know more friends out of the group. Did you get that? So we we kind of go back. It's a little a little different than the SWOT analysis, but the same sort of activity that works really well. It's a nice fun one to to get people up and you know kind of walking and talking to each other, especially with those freshmen that don't know anybody yet. It's great. Yeah, and the come back to at midterm, I think, is a smart idea too. Yeah. Yeah, a little kind of natural, low key opportunity to kind of evaluate how they're doing and what they're doing. Yeah, and a tool that we got from um, I know there's some SIMD folks in here with me. I saw saw their names flash by, but uh, Adam um, Watkins brought it up, and I don't remember if he said he got it from somebody else. I think he did, but I can't remember who. But he used um, sort of a, a mid semester survey, especially during this time when we're all online, called um, Keep Start Stop. Mm -hmm. um, and I, yeah, I assume that came from somebody. I don't know if it came from you, Susan, or somebody else, but um, basically- It's been just, around all over the place, you know. Yeah, yeah, so that was really useful for, for getting feedback from the students um, all the way through this. It was super useful for those little, you know, fun little tools to, for people to access. Yeah. So we have another, another comment about using peer reviews for extra credit. So what kind of peer reviews, what kind of assignments you wanna talk um, to? I, um, Hi. For, uh, hi. <laughs> um, uh, they, they talked about missing interaction and seeing what kind of work, you know, they were each doing. So like for a history journal, I, when they completed, I put them all on Blackboard and created a chart where each one of them had to give each other a review. And then I collected the reviews and gave each one what everybody said about their project. And um, so like for the history journal, someone might have focused on materials, it was history of the built environment. Someone focused on decorative arts. They all focused on different things. So they were able to comment 
and share ideas. And also I got less questions about why did I get a BE or why did I get, they were able to see uh, in terms of how much they did and how, how much someone else did. And they all felt like they benefited from that experience and, and they got extra credit. They probably did it for extra credit, but it was sure. really more about learning, you know, from each other. So I actually did it from all of my, all of my classes. I did at least one peer review. It was a lot of work for me to copy paste and you know, forward all of that, but I did it for each of my classes and I found that helpful. And so they saw the work electronically and then they yeah, did the, yeah, yeah, okay. there were all digital presentations. So it was like precedent studies. It was a, um, a, a history, yeah, history journal, which was about 30 or 40 you know, slides. And they went in and actually reviewed and then filled out the, the form and then emailed it to me. And then I collected all of the comments for each individual and then you know, mailed it out to, to them. It was extra work, but I think it was, I think they benefited from it. Yeah, I think that's a really nice idea. And, you know, at least from the, the writing instruction literature, um, there's some pretty good evidence that students do a better job with peer reviews when you give them an instrument the way you did. Give them a form to fill out. Uh, left to their own devices, they, they may not focus as well. Yeah, we've done it in class and it wasn't as successful. Sometimes they'll just write, I liked it, or, or even not do it at all. Uh, so, so yeah. this time they actually took the time to write out what it is they liked and I gave them instructions in terms of did they meet the requirements, what did you, what did you think about the layout, what did you think about the content. So exactly. they actually reviewed and, and, you know, and gave that feedback. And you know, when, when we go back to having presentations face to face, um, I find that having them do peer reviews makes them a better audience. It makes the dynamic in the room a little more lively and I also have them pass the peer reviewed straight over to the person. So they're actually, yeah. uh, and that makes a difference. There's nothing more dreadful than presentation after presentation with nobody listening to those poor presenters, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you for sharing that. Have we got any last calls for comments or questions? Cause we are in the home stretch. Um, I wouldn't mind sharing one thing that I, I found. It's actually a um, digital platform called Murals. I don't know if anyone has had experience with that yet. Yeah. Yeah. It's a, um, here we go. It's actually a way, uh, you know, as much as we're going online right now, it's a great tool for that. And if you have a .edu, it is free. You just have to write in and, and basically they'll, they'll give you an account for free. But it's a way of sort of, if you're, you're used to brainstorming using post-it notes, that sort of thing, they've got quite a few fun templates and your students can get in and they can use this sort of platform. So it's just, just want to throw it out there as, you know, people are looking for new tools, especially some of the classes are still online over summer and we certainly don't know about fall. Um, but that's uh, a tool that as long as you have a .edu email address, you can get it for free and students should be able to get in there as well. But it's a um, basically a visual collaboration workspace and they've got a lot of templates that you can use and it's fairly, um, fairly intuitive. It take, you know, there's a little bit of a learning curve to it if you're trying to get into more of the bells and whistles. But for the most part, you want to just slap some stuff up there and get student feedback or, you know, it's a different type of discussion board that's more fast, faster, I guess, rather than more fast, um, and more visual. More visual, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. really interesting. Sure that and it could work nicely for like small groups to, to kind of brainstorm ideas for a presentation or. Yeah, presentation. yeah, yeah, I think so. And it, it's um, mural.co. I don't know. Why. Okay. Yeah. So it's just mural.co. And usually if you type in just mural on a Google search, it'll be the first one that shows up. Okay. Yeah. Just throw that out there for everyone. Great. Thank you. Appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I had a question about will this recording be posted for review? Yeah, we're working on getting a YouTube channel, but in the meantime, I'll put it on the Center for Teaching and Learning site. So it's. Um, well, I'll have it posted by this evening. Oh, okay, great. Okay, it'll be posted on uh, what, you, uh, YouTube link? Yes. Okay, great. Do you, hey, uh, Adela, do you want to put the uh, link in the chat? There it is. Oops, that's there it is. Right. No. Just like that. Thank you, Adela. That was for Sister Eileen. Sorry. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll Never put, mind, I'll don't put go the there. link on the CTL site as like well. <laughs> uh, okay, it's this one. This. 
uh, www.youtube.com channel. This is where all the videos that we have up so far can be found. I'm not sure I see it, Adele. Uh, uh, it's, uh, it starts, I know, that just forget the Amazon one. It's <laughs> HT. Oh, oh, okay, I see it's the second one. Gotcha. I was reading them all as one great big, really long URL. Yeah, it's not, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, thank you all very much for coming. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much for your help. Thanks. Thanks everyone for sharing. <laughs>